Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Marco Verlese. Uh, I work for SUSE. Uh, I'm based in Italy. Uh, I am a VPP committer upstream, and that's why I'm going to talk to you about VPP today. Um, this is a sort of follow-up uh, presentation from last year. Okay. Uh, from uh, my last year presentation at uh, OpenSUSE conference, um, and it's specific to how to implement a new protocol in VPP. So it's quite technical, uh, and there's just like two slides introduction to VPP, so uh, hopefully you'll, you'll follow. Uh, I'm going to use SCTP protocol as an example to drive you through my presentation because it is actually the protocol that I implemented in VPP uh, and which got accepted upstream end of January. So I'm fairly familiar uh, with the protocol, the RFC, and how things are implemented. Uh, SCTP has been the protocol added after the two other more important ones, TCP and UDP, which are already part of the VPP stack. So just a brief idea of what SCTP is. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a protocol. It's a, a stands uh, for a stream transport, uh, stream control transport protocol, and it's defined by an RFC as the other ones, the 4960. Um, it's, a it's a reliable protocol, uh, and is obviously working on top of a connectionless uh, packet network, which is IP. Uh, th there are a lot of uh, important features that SCTP brought uh, into the world uh, compared to TCP. Uh, this is just like a very, very brief summary, which I consider to be the most important ones. Uh, and I don't necessarily want you to read through it or remember this. Uh, what I want to emphasize with this slide is that um, uh, SCTP, like TCP and other protocols, is really a huge uh, protocol. There was obviously a lot of emphasis and efforts put in to make it a, a, a protocol to be used by, by the community. Uh, the reason why I put in this slide is really connected to what I will conclude with in my uh, for my presentation, which are like the consideration that you should take into account when developing a new uh, a new protocol for VPP. So, <clears throat> first of all, what is VPP? Okay, is VPP is an acronym and it stands for Vector Packet Processing. Um, which obviously means that it's opposed to something else, which is the scalar packet processing, which uh, people are used to uh, for the last 30 years, and which is the one that is used also by the Linux kernel. Um, what is why why VPP is becoming very very popular? Well, first of all, it's a, an extensible framework. Uh, and it's based on the concept of plugins, uh, which I'll talk to you in a bit. Uh, and the most, uh, the, 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 the important point about VPP is that it is a production quality, uh, stack. In fact, um, VPP, uh, was open sourced, uh, by Cisco uh, in 2012, roughly. Uh, 2012, 2013, uh, which is really the core of what Cisco has been uh, developing and deploying into their own appliances for many, many years. Uh, it is part, VPP is a project in what is the, the bigger family project, which is called FIDO, written FD.io. And now, uh, starting from January 2018, FIDO is part of even a much bigger uh, open source project, which is the LFN, the Linux uh, Foundation Networking Fund, where all the um, where all the main uh, networking projects are now sort of uh, managed and uh, yeah managed by by under one single entity. 
so that this is this picture is somehow tries to to summarize the modularity, the flexibility, and the extensibility of VPP. So VPP is based on uh, graph and nodes. So basically, imagine for example uh, your um, your L4 protocol that's sitting well four layers above when the packet comes in onto the network. You can consider the steps that are bringing you from the packet coming onto the wire up to your L4 protocol as a series of arches and nodes. Uh, and obviously each node has an incoming arch and outgoing one. Uh, why it is flexible? Well, as I said it before, uh, it's based on this plugin infrastructure. So imagine that you want to write a new functionality. Um, this functionality doesn't have to be living into the core piece of VPP. You can write your, uh, your, your functionality, your feature as a stand alone one, following obviously the, the coding guidelines on how to plug this into the VPP uh, stack. Uh, and this is now a, an entity on its own, which can be registered with the VPP stack. Uh, uh, and then when, uh, when processing needs to happen, obviously your node now, which is your plugin, will be coming part of the graph. Um, how you do this? Well, when you register a new plugin, for example, you can tell uh, where in the graph your uh, your plugin comes into the picture. So after which one it's ne it needs to be called and uh, what's coming next. Now, uh, back to the original um, topic of this presentation is how you go and implement a new protocol. In VPP, there is a um, there is a one important structure um, that you need to, to to look at. It's called a transport protocol, uh, and this this uh, this structure basically defines the set of uh, function that you will have to implement in order for the stack uh, to deal with your uh, with your um, with your implementation. Uh, obviously, because we are talking about a, a NEL4 protocol here, you obviously can can make a one-to-one -one map with what uh, in Linux uh, you're used to with the sockets, for example. So this this structure uh, somehow uh, reminds you of the steps that you need to do in order to, for example, uh, be a server on a machine or be a client on a machine. So, for example, you'll find out that there are function pointers to, to something to called bind or close or open. Uh, uh, and there are other, um, there are also other uh, pointers which are specific to, to the implementation of how VPP deals with an L4 protocol. So, for example, in, um, when you want to send a packet onto the network, you you'll obviously have to know uh, how much, uh, how many bytes you can you can ship, right? And this is this is for two main reasons. One is your um, your uh, physical interface may or may not support a specific size or your network, uh, and also because depending on which protocol you're dealing with, there are obviously all the protocol specific requirements that you need to take care of when uh, when streaming a, a number of bytes and i'm i'm referring to for example the famous window size uh, of a protocol this is uh, true in tcp in udp and similarly in sctp so there are function pointers that allow you to basically register your function to deal with uh, how you compute the amount of data that you can send to the network um, and which obviously is dictated by the protocol itself, because different protocols have different type of calculations, and then different protocols also uh, specify what they are called the congestion algorithms. So depending on which congestion algorithms you are uh, picking up, there are there are different maths applied to how much data you can actually send. So the, that that that. Um, this structure here, which I uh, I understand, it's quite complex to read because there are a lot 
there are many, many uh, roles, um, is the one that allows you to, to hook up a new implementation into VPP. Uh, the next thing to do is to obviously uh, identify your output node uh, and your input node. Uh, why you need to do this? Well, because now the, the stack needs to know how to ship data uh, out, of your, uh, out of your machine or how to read data in, uh, in VPP from, from the outside world. Uh, and and, and there, there, are, there is basically a macro in VPP which is called vlib uh, init function. Uh, and to this, uh, to this macro you can pass in simply uh, the, the, your main function where you register your protocol and where you take care of uh, basically registering with the, with the transport layer through, again, a, a specific API in VPP which is called transport register protocol. Uh, it's quite straightforward. You just need to basically pass in uh, a bunch of uh, uh, defines, which are basically the number of the number protocol identified by the YANA, uh, for example, assignment. Uh, and uh, this function has to be called obviously twice, because you may want or may not want to register the protocol for IPv4 and IPv6. So, depending whether you're sub you're uh, supporting both v4 and v6 or just one or the other, you may just call it once or twice. Uh, finally, at this stage here, uh, depending on uh, whether you are exporting in VPP a set of API for the end user, in this case, uh, not the end user on the other side of the, of the machine receiving traffic, but the end user that could be at the console configuring uh, VPP or your protocol, uh, so if you, if you think about this situation where you want to expose a, a set of API to a, an administrator, then you may want to register your API at this stage as well. Um, and again, this is going to be just a, a, a simple function call, which is uh, how you, for example, could expose, export uh, the API to be called by the uh, VPP CLI or by the language bindings existing in VPP. Uh, PPP supports C, C++, Python, Java, and Lua bindings. So, and, and, and all this is actually done in a very convenient way for developers because you only have to use a, a, sol a sort of uh, uh, temporary language or uh, um, uh, abstract language, and then the, 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 the lex lexicon basically takes this and, and provides API for the different language bindings. So you only have to do this once. Uh, as I said, the, on the other side, now we have taken care of the, of the output node. There is obviously an input node, uh, which deals with packet com coming in. Uh, by default, uh, in VPP, the, uh, the session layer, which is basically the layer that uh, is taking care of your transports, is disabled. So this means that uh, VPP doesn't really deal with uh, things happening at L4. And in order to make it, uh, to, 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 well, to turn it on, there is uh, the enable uh, function pointer which needs to be implemented and which needs to take care of registering your new protocol with the IP4, uh, with the IP4 layer, and again, this is done in a, a very easy and straightforward way by calling the IP4 register protocol or IP6 register protocol, passing in again uh, simply your uh, protocol number and the index of your input node. So where is where is the node in in the graph uh, to be called? Another uh, important aspect of uh, protocols in general is that basically, and, and above all with rel reliable protocols uh, like TCP or SCTP uh, and many others, is that um, once you send data to the other peer, um, you expect to, to receive a knock from, from the peer telling you that it has received the data. Uh, this is how TCP works and this is how SCTP works. Um, to do this, obviously, you need to know when the data has been uh, sent in order to keep track of the time that has lapsed 
Uh, and in order to do this, VPP offers a, a nice mechanism, which are the, the timers. Uh, to this, you can have multiple timers depending on, for example, the stage at which you are in during the, the initialization phase, for example, of the protocol or shutdown, or if you are in full established mode. So depending on how the, the protocol deals with timing, you may have one timer or multiple. Um, the, the, the nice thing about the timers, obviously, once they expire, uh, your function, your callback function gets invoked, and so now you can deal with uh, how you manage uh, the expiration of a timer. Um, and you may know that that timer, for example, uh, is connected to a specific event on the network. So if I am in established phase and I'm sending data, and now the other peer is not hacking the data back to me, it means that something has happened. Uh, the network uh, might be down down the line, there might be hops uh, that are no longer working, but then the protocol implementation needs to react on this. Uh, you may need to, for example, resend the data up to X number of times. Uh, you will have to do different things based on the congestion algorithm that has been chosen, for example. Any of those scenarios can be implemented by using the uh, timer infrastructure in VPP. Now, um, from, from now on, I can I give you a little bit of uh, tips uh, about how I implemented the SCTP uh, in VPP. Uh, and so it's a sort of lessons learned from, from my experience. So, first of all, um, it's, it's really, really nice to have a dispatcher node as your first incoming node. Um, why why doing that is because in one single place you can uh, you can do multiple things first of all you can as 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 the word says dispatch you can obviously dispatch specific type of messages that are coming over the network to the, to the specialized node uh, and so basically having uh, smaller nodes smaller functions that are very very specific and that are more manageable from a source code perspective. Uh, but at the same time, in this mode, you, you actually also implement uh, all the uh, corner case scenarios uh, that can happen on the network uh, and that are not foreseen by the protocol. So, um, for example, if you are in a closed state in SCTP, uh, you, you cannot receive by protocol an init hack. Uh, it's just wrong. The, the, the RFC says that it's an error. So in this way, by having a dispatch node, you can say, okay, if I am in this situation, then obviously the next node that has to deal with, uh, with this message for this state machine, it's error. So it, it becomes really a very easy way. It becomes really a table, a dispatch table rather than a big function with all switch and cases or ifs uh, and else's, it becomes a big dispatch table uh, with pointers to function depending on which message you received and on what is your uh, state machine in. Obviously, the different nodes in your implementation will deal with the state machine as well of the protocol. So, moving the state machine from one state to the other from a closed state to an initialization state to an established state or shutdown state, etc., etc. So how does uh, the, the, the implementation for SCTP looks like, which is not very different anyway from what the TCP implementation looks like? Well, first of all, it's a graph, as I said it earlier. That's because how VPP works. Um, and there are multiple nodes in this graph with arches. And as I said, the, 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 the first and uh, most, well, the first node receiving every single packet is the dispatcher node. Uh, from, from there, you can go to the different nodes which are really uh, remembering the different states of the protocol. So you could be in listen or uh, receive or established or shut down. 
what can happen, obviously, is that depending on the the packet that you receive, then you can move to either the output node because you have to send a reply to the other peer, or you could you could move obviously to the error drop node. The error drop node uh, is a it's a, it's a nice feature. It's basically can it's basically cannibalizing uh, the packet. Doesn't doesn't the packet doesn't proceed any any anywhere else, and depending on uh, which error you pass in to the error drop node, uh, you can have statistics showing you uh, if it was, for example, a, a, a malfor malformed frame or whatever, depending on how you implemented it. But uh, it basically helps you with getting getting rid of packets that are not good. At, at a given stage, or that are malformed, really, because you, during the parsing uh, of of a frame, you could realize that it's just wrong. So it's a sort of a, a important node and helper in in the in the graph. Uh, then, obviously, you have what I al already said earlier is the session layer. Uh, the session layer is uh, is the layer that sits on top of the transport layer where obviously a protocol is implemented and the application layer where you have an application that tries to send or receive packets. And the, the, um, the, 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 the scope uh, or the job of the session layer is to basically uh, do two things, to enqueue packets towards PPP when, when the application is trying to send data or to enqueue data up to the application when the data is being received. Uh, what does this mean is that the nodes that are sitting in the transport layer, so your protocol, will obviously have to do two things with the session layer, or interact with the session layer in two different ways. One is by enqueuing data to the, to the session layer, or by notifying uh, the session layer of state changes. The notification really happens at two, for two different reasons. One, the, 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 the first reason is that um, a connection now has been established, so the two peers can talk to each other, and so the session layer needs to know about it because the application can now send and receive data. And similarly, if the connection has been shut down for any reason, there is a notification going to the session la layer, which uh, closes all the, the the connection to the application and frees up the the data structures, so so that basically the connection now can be considered to be dead. Um, the the other uh, the other node in this uh, in this picture is the output node. The output node does uh, very little. Uh, and this is meant to be very, very quick. And the only thing that basically does is to enqueue the, the, the frame down to the next level, which is the IP layer. So where uh, the data is basically being formed in an uh, in IP frame before, can, before it can be sent. So uh, very briefly, the, 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 the file organization and this is again. This comes from uh, from the experience that uh, that that I had and uh, how things are uh, can kind of organized to make things very clear and easy to follow and to manage from uh, from a source code perspective. Um, there are few header files, uh, and the C files usually reminds you of the whether it's a, it's the input side or the out, output side. Of, of the picture. So whether the, the, the implementation contained in the C file has to deal with incoming frames or outgoing frames. Um, the, dot a, the, the header files usually contain uh, functions that are basically obviously exposed between the different C files or in the, in the packet header file. The, uh, this, this file contains all the information that help you to, to identify a specific message of your protocol. Obviously, um, TCP, for example, deals a lot with the bits setting a specific, uh, a specific offset in the message to specify different functionality or different features. SCTP instead uh, 
uh, is not using bits and flags to identify specific um, uh, specific situation or, sp or specific message types. Uh, it has its own uh, definition of messages. So in order to do that, it's very convenient to, for example, have structures that are reminding you of how this message is shipped to the network or received from the network. So, yes, lessons learned. So, um, why I, why I put put this in? Well, uh, it's 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 really it's really nice. I actually uh, I was hoping before starting to have somebody telling me how you how you go and do this. Uh, so when I put these slides together, I thought uh, it could be very very cool if you're interested in uh, developing network protocols or network projects. To, to already know something about how the community uh, deals with uh, with software development. So, uh, implementing a new protocol, it doesn't matter whether you do it in VPP or you do it in Linux or you start from scratch, it's not an easy task. It's, um, it, it's, it's going to be very complicated and it means re really reading a lot of RFC um, text. Uh, sometimes it can be easy. Sometimes you have to read between the line what things are uh, are meant to be, uh, and a lot of things that are left to interpretation then are done differently depending on which stack you look at. Uh, so for those, for example, for for those cases, you really need to 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 think about: uh, Will I follow the others, or I will do something completely different? It's a uh, it's a lot of uh, um, interesting innovation as well. Uh, so, how you how would you go then to to implement a new protocol and approach the FIDO community? Well, first of all, something that it's uh, I found it to be really really cool um, and important for for the for the development uh, was to use draft patches. So the FIDO VPP community uses uh, Garrett as a as an interface for uh, basically uh, looking at patches, uh, reviewing patches, etc. Uh, why the draft patch? Well, I started the the the, the, the rationale be, be behind the draft patch was different from what it ended up to. Uh, I I I, uh, I used the draft patch initially to save my work because I was developing on my machine at home, uh, and the last thing that you want is that um, uh, the machine breaks or the hard drive dies, and then you have lost a couple of months worth worth of work. Um, so I, I start using the draft patch as a mechanism to save my source code to uh, to, to 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 get it. Uh, all of a sudden, though, I thought that it was a very convenient way to start getting feedback, private feedback, to my work by core reviewers, core people in VPP. And in fact, I start getting feedback uh, and. Uh, and suggestions on how to to make things better or how to deal with certain problems. So definitely, like uh, one of the suggestion I would give uh, is to go and use draft patches as much as you can. Uh, and obviously, when you believe that your work is ready, which means at least you have some unit tests for your uh, for your stack and uh, it's building fine, and the integration looks good to you, then you can go public. Why waiting for this? Well, un unless you have at least tested once your stack and it's brand new code, uh, it's really, really hard to ask somebody else who's very, very busy with other things to review 10,000 lines of code from scratch. Uh, SCTP implementation is roughly 12,000 lines of code today. So when I pushed it to, to Garrett, I was also a little bit afraid that people said, look, it's going to take us six months to review this. Uh, but there is also like a trust between uh, people that are committers and people that are authors. Uh, and how do you, do you build this trust? Is obviously showing up, showing that your code works. It's not just like dead code. To, to prove that it works, you need to have tests. Uh, and the test that I used, for example, was an existing echo server, uh, echo client server application that was using previously TCP. Uh, and when I came in with SCTP, well, I just switched the protocol to SCTP 
and the application was still working. So that, that now was a standalone application using a brand new protocol in VPP. Uh, another comment I have is about missing features. Um, today is, it, is end of May almost, and uh, the first implementation of SCDP got in January. And there were like obviously uh, more patches and more uh, things who went in during these months. Uh, and there are still missing features for, for the protocol. What I'm trying to say is that you don't have to go and implement the full RFC uh, down to the commas in order to have your code um, upstreamed and accepted because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's understood that it's a lot of work and it's a lot of testing. And in order to have something upstreamed, you should have the core functionality, what you think that you, you really believe it's the core functionality of a protocol to, to, to be working. And then you can consider the corner cases after that. Uh, and that's also the reason why they are corner cases. They are kind of small cases that can happen uh, due to many different reasons over the network. Uh, but if you go and implement first the corner cases and then the main functionality, it will take you, rather than six months, it will take you likely 18 months. <laughs> because you are you're not in a position to then test the full stack unless you're done. So this is another recommendation I would have. So there's a lot of ongoing work. Um, uh, so if you are interested, please ping me. As I said, I, I'm a committer on the project. Uh, I'm author of SCTP and of the Geneva implementation in VPP, Geneva Tunnel implementation. So there is, for example, uh, the message bundling feature of SCTP is yet to be implemented. The message bundling means that uh, together with uh, control, control, pure control messages, you can uh, you can bundle data to those to those um, to those frames, so that you can save up, uh, send and receive bytes over the network. So that has to be done. There's a lot of hardening and testing that is still ongoing and that needs attention and more eyes. Um, implementation of new congestion algorithms is uh, still also welcome. <clears throat> so all in all, there's a lot of room to for work and for uh, new features to be implemented. Um, so if you are interested, again, ping me. Now, question. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, wait for, so, so maybe it's recorded in the uh, audio. <clears throat> the question was, could you say a few words more about how you personally and OpenSUSE and possibly SUSE or someone else is using this VPP software? Yeah, so <clears throat> speaking about SUSE, uh, we, uh, we have the VPP source code packagized and available for lib15 and on uh, tumbleweed uh, the the main the main um, uh, the main uh, goal or the, the the main deployment that people are are targeting for VPP is the vswitching area so the vswitching virtual virtual switching so it, it somehow opposed to open vSwitch as a sort of uh, product that does similar similar uh, functionality, which is virtual switching. Um, <clears throat> people, t people tend to, 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 to put, put them on the same page or trying to do comparison between the two. It's really, really hard. Uh, it's not fair for the one or the other, but this is the main, uh, this is the main idea. Where, for example, you can uh, you can use VPP similar to what you use uh, OBS, Open vSwitch, 
for, uh, for example, packet switching between VMs or uh, containers or uh, doing, uh, <clears throat> sorry, doing tunnels between endpoints and all, uh, all the kind of NFV uh, area. Yes. Uh, you can as well. Like uh, there is there is a functionality in VPP which is the ACL functionality. Uh, what you can do is basically implement a firewall with it. Um, so if you're familiar with IP tables, for example, it does the same same functionality that IP tables allow you. So dropping or forwarding, accepting traffic. Uh, using the tuple um, configuration. And again, it has uh, routing support, it does, it does uh, full FIB uh, support for V4 and V6. I didn't switch it off. Now it is. A background of the question was that uh, we're here in Prague today, and um, there is at least one person from CZ.NIC here, from the you know the, the network um, organization. They're developing, I think, the third generation of routers, so you may want to get in touch with them. Okay. Yeah, thank you. When interacting with FIDO uh, in the upstream, what are the pain point areas as you know, a contributor and committer? What are the parts of FIDO itself, you know, the, the project that are painful? I was asked a similar question in Copenhagen. Um, to be honest with you, it's really hard for me to find a a negative in the community itself. Uh, it's a. I always found it, even when I started uh, the early days, to be a very open and friendly community. Uh, sure, if you if you go and uh, and look uh, at the mailing list and the patches, etc., uh, the the big core it's uh, it's Cisco. Based and and it makes total sense, right? They they were the guys developing it uh, for for many years and upstreaming it, and they're still developing it. Uh, but there there are lots of um, new people coming in uh, with the new ideas, with the new pair of eyes. So the pain points, something that uh, has been mentioned by others as well. It's um, likely the. Um, Lack, but it's it's not really the it, the, the, document, the documentation is not great around the project. Okay, so you find uh, you, you you find some initial uh, hooks that you can use, but then it's really getting your hands dirty and and look into the code and and, and do things with the code. Uh, it obviously also depends whether you're um, you're interested in the develop development of the code versus uh, the deployment and uh, integration with other components. So for example, uh, VPP in itself, uh, it's, as I said, it's uh, one project. And there are other projects that are dealing with how you go and integrate VPP, for example, with OpenStack. How you would go and use VPP with uh, containers or uh, uh, scenarios uh, that you can have specifically to one versus the other domain. Um, it's it's really really like the Fido community. I think it's it's very very big. Uh, VPP is uh, just one, and I only look after. Well, I only work on VPP. Um, yeah, I I would say I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be afraid to be honest with you of approaching the the community. Uh, there are lots of good people that are always uh, replying to your email. As I said, from early days. So.
Could you just quickly spell out what FIDO actually stands for? Fast Data IO. So the the and it's it's nice because then they actually because it sounds like FIDO, they make the picture like the dog. But uh, fast data input output, yeah. Okay. Thank you.